signature line there. I, I don't like being behind podiums, but I have to because the computer's over here. <laughs> so um, I, I'm the Vice President of Regulatory Affairs for AOPA. And I actually, you know, our, our home office is in Frederick, Maryland. And however, we have a downtown DC office. And I run our regulatory affairs group and then our legislative body and also our airports and state advocacy group uh, offices there in DC. We also have uh, seven regional managers that are out across the state to do advocacy work at the state and local level and try to prevent, uh, and they're very successful at it most of the time, prevent airport closures, airport encroachment, uh, just everything bad that happens. Um, so I get asked a lot, well, how'd you get where you are, you know, so I'll, I'll share a little bit about me uh, in the beginning. And, and by the way, Mosaic is a part of this, but I also have the unleaded fuel part of that in here and some other discussions and anything else you want to talk about, ask about. So uh, I, I was thinking the way I would do this, Mosaic's going to come up first after a few slides in the beginning. And I'll probably do question and answers on Mosaic and then I'll go into the unleaded fuel. Does that make sense to you? Is that good for everyone? Okay. All right, so uh, that S76 pulled up <laughs> when I was driving in here. I, I absolutely love helicopters. I'm a helicopter pilot. Uh, this is actually me out in Mesa, Arizona flying that 500 this past summer. I, uh, Background, I did 10 years in the military, three Army, seven Air Force, all active duty. Uh, however, I wanted to fly, I never could because I wore glasses back then. So I was in aircraft maintenance. Uh, and then uh, did three Army and, and got out after that because I got married. <laughs> and then uh, decided I'd go back into the military. So I was trained by the Air Force when I was in the Army. So I called the recruiter and said, hey, I, here's my career field. I'm already qualified. And they said, well, yeah, we need you, and they put me out at Beale Air Force Base. And the highlight of my military career is I worked SR-71s and U-2s. Uh, so I did about four years total on those aircraft, maintaining them. Absolutely loved it. Um, and then uh, after I got out of the military, because they wouldn't let me fly, uh, I got my ratings, got private ratings, and then uh, did 20 year, I entered the FAA after that. I did 20 year career with the FAA as a safety inspector maintenance and retired in 2020 when AOPA called and said we really want your experience in this VP job up here running our regulatory group so I could refuse <laughs> so I left yeah I even left early to do that so loved it uh, been with three been three years with the AOPA in that position last July was uh, three years for me and a private airplane instrument and helicopter rated uh, also an A&P from my military background and a senior parachute rigger, which the FAA sent me to because as an inspector I had to approve parachute riggers. And you can't do that unless you're a parachute rigger, so they paid for that for me. Uh, and then education, bachelor's in aviation management, 10 years after high school, I might add. Uh, did an MBA after that and then I am finishing, I'm in a Albert dissertation level with doctorate right now. Uh, should finish it February and walk in May with a doctorate in education leadership. Uh, so, you know, I'm a firm believer that you got to keep your mind and body busy as you get older. So I, I don't, blood for punishment, I guess, for education, but I love it. Uh, so tonight's agenda, I'm going to talk a little bit about the state of general aviation. Little, just a couple slides on AOPA, uh, what we're doing. Then I'm going to get into Mosaic. And then unleaded fuel, have some discussion on that, what's going on, it's kind of status of where things are. A uh, few information resources, and then I'll talk about 2024, what's coming. Any questions so far about that? Okay. All right, state of GA. Um, obviously, GA operations are up. Uh, you know, where during COVID, when that happened, you know, there was a couple months where GA dropped off just like everything else, but then it just, it came back so quick. Um, you know, the commercials, they were down for years, and, but GA was right back up where they were almost pre-COVID within a few months. And that's just due to the support GA did because commercial couldn't fly. So we were moving product, doctors, medicines all around the country. Uh, 
So we had a lot of things going on there. And obviously flight schools are busier probably than they've ever been right now. Uh, I know schools that have a waiting list to get in. Um, cert certificate numbers, new pilots definitely uh, continue to increase. Obviously there's a huge shortage of uh, pilots and that's one of the reasons I decided to do, do to do a doctorate in educational leadership was the aviation side of the house and, and the shortage. My original, the research I'm doing right now, it, the original research question was how to increase youth at a younger age, get them interested in aviation because of the shortage. So I interviewed the owner of the flight school that I'm using for site for the research. He said, Murray, he says, you know, it's, it's true. There, there's definitely a shortage, but he said, that's not the real problem. The real problem is I have a waiting list of students to come here, and the real problem is getting them to finish, the ones that start training. You know, there's nationally, it's about 80% do not finish that certificate uh, at the private level. So there's a huge washout rate, uh, and for whatever reason, some of them's cost, some of it, so, you know, many, many, uh, many reasons are given yet there's no research in that area that I found. So I switched my research question to exactly that, how to, how to get students to complete their training, what can be done. So it's been fun doing this, and I plan on doing further research after that. Uh, that bottom statistic is, is actually huge. That, that's $247 billion industry that GA provides, and it supports 1.2 million jobs in the United States. So it, it's, I mean, there's no question the value that GA has for nationally for the economy. A little bit on uh, AOPA. This year we're 84 years, uh, is, and next year is our 85th anniversary. I'll talk a little bit about that here in, at, towards the end. Um, we're a community that shares a single and powerful passion, and everything we do is to protect the freedom to fly. I mean, bottom line, that's that's why we're that's why we exist. That's why we have such a strong legislative group uh, there in D.C. and regulatory as well. Uh, like I said, I came out of the FAA, so I just switched sides of the table. And having that connections and network, I'm able to when their members are having problems, it, it comes to me through even Mark Baker from the president. Hey, can you make a call? And so I do, and, and most of the time I can get it handled without having to escalate. So occasionally I have to do that too, and I, I don't mind doing it when I need to. <laughs> but it's not the first first approach I take. So now a little bit on mosaic, and got a test question. Anyone, can anyone tell me what mosaic stands for? It stands for. <laughs> Modernization of Special Airworthiness Certification. FAA loves their acronyms. <laughs> Where's the I come from? I, I asked that same question. I think it's just in airworthiness, there's a couple I's. So <laughs> that's all I can figure. <laughs> so the NPRM was issued July 24 of this year. And the original due date for comments was October 20th, I think. It has now been extended by 90 days out to January 22nd, 23. Uh, how many of you have raised that word? Say again? 24. Oh, I typo. I don't believe that. I mean, if you knew how many times I've been in this thing, <laughs> that's embarrassing. Um, so 24. Uh, let me see. What else? It provides a wide-ranging expansion of light sport aircraft performance envelope and the types of aircraft that are going to qualify under the light sport category. Uh, now one thing this thing did is it, sep it, it separates light sport pilot and light sport aircraft. This is only speaking, it, it, this delves into a little bit of the light sport pilot privileges, but it's primarily speaking to the aircraft. So it's important to remember that as we as this goes forward. Uh, on the comment period, I, I remember what I was going to say there. 
that comment period, it's very important if you've been in the NPRM and reading that and you see areas where there's issues that uh, we really need to have this type of aircraft be able to qualify. I've already identified several of those. Um, then that's what the, that's, this comment period is for. And everyone should be commenting if you see areas. Uh, we as associations, uh, many of you may know uh, Rob Hackman with EAA. <laughs> He's your, your the regulatory guy uh, that I work with closely. We are actually have meetings weekly now on developing association level comments for Mosaic, uh, where we are in agreement. We'll, uh, a lot of times we'll do that on really important issues so that we can get the, the most impact to the FAA because, you know, we're, we're, our, we're almost 300,000 strong, AOPA is, and the EAA is, you know, they're, they're big also. So when you combine association level impact in the FAA, they, they don't have a choice but to listen. So that's why we do that. Some areas of the NPRM need clarification. We've been identifying that already and or adjustments to the language to ensure appropriate aircraft are included. Uh, that, you know, and I'll get into the specifics of, yeah, on the next slide. Uh, let me do that first and then I'll come back to that. Um, so some of the things the expansion is going to do is remove the current 1,320 pound aircraft weight limit for light sport aircraft. <laughs> the weight limit is not going to be listed even uh, if it go, if the NPRM if the final rule comes out as currently written in the NPRM. And the way they're kind of controlling the size of the aircraft is that 54 knot calibrated airspeed, and that is the clean stall speed. So clean as flaps and gear up. So 54 knots is an area where we've got to comment because it, there's some aircraft you would think are going to qualify and they won't because they're above 54 knot clean stall speed. So we, we're going to be uh, commenting on that and anyone, if you have uh, have identified aircraft that don't qualify, that should, should qualify, then uh, by all means you should comment as well. Um, controllable pitch propellers, any number and type of engines. So any kind of engine, electric, it, it's opening that wide up. Uh, the reason you say any number, you can have twins, you can have multi-rotor. So this is also bringing in EV tall that's going to come in under here. Uh, so it's really, the FAA has done a good job of trying to expand this. And they actually added stuff that industry never even requested. So FAA is thinking ahead in a lot of areas trying to look to the future of aircraft certification. 250 knot airstream, uh, that's up from the one current 120. So you're going to get some very powerful, very capable, high-performance aircraft coming into the center. Up to four seats. However, as the comment says there, the light sport pilot, as currently written, is still going to be limited to one passenger. Even though it's a four-seat aircraft, they can only carry one passenger. I, I've already talked. As I said, I have contacts the uh, Part. 27 helicopters, uh, I already mentioned that, they're not being considered, and even if they were, if they said, okay, if you're a two-seat helicopter, a certified 27 helicopter right now, like an R-22, you can come into light sport. Well, you got Hughes and Schweitzer, 300s, Instrums, all the others are three-seat. It's like you're, you're gonna eliminate those. And so that's another area where we'll be <laughs> and there's no doubt there's going to be a lot of others identified, a lot of other areas that will need to be commented on. Uh, but don't get me wrong, this is, this is normal in an NPRM. You're always going to find stuff that needs to be adjusted. Uh, you know, a lot of time it's, it's the engineers at the FAA that are doing these things, and you get the rulemaking side of the house with their input, the lawyers involved, and so they need help a lot of times from industry to say, nah, that's really not right, not the way it works. So, uh, and that's what we're here to do. And as I said, I already work working with the other associations on joint comments to get that uh, um, impact <coughs> into the FAA. So how is this being accomplished? As far as 
the once mosaic comes in, how is that being put in? Uh, how, how does it happen? So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. You may know ASTM, so that's the standard international standard organization. Uh, the F-37 Light Sport Committee is the one that is doing that, and what they do, I, I can say we, because I sit on the executive committee for that. Um, we are the ones that will be establishing the consensus standards that's developed for how new light sport aircraft under Mosaic will be manufactured. So we're, we're the ones that put the standard, we'll, we'll put the standards out. The FAA in turn accepts those standards. So, and there's a lot of areas where this is already in effect. We're just bringing this approach into the LSA area. And what this is gonna do long, longer term, I already mentioned that, mentioned that, I was getting ahead of myself. So this, the consensus is between industry OEMs, associations, and the users. So by the time that consensus standard has been uh, voted on and approved by the committee, it has been thoroughly vetted. And believe me, it goes, <laughs> You, I spent all this week. I've been in committed in this in this very committee, all this week, uh, and there's a lot of uh, discussions. <laughs> uh, you know, from I mean, just the it's all engineers too, and I'm not an engineer, so it's above some of it's above my head. But I, I can keep it real, you know, <laughs> and bring it back down to level. Yes. So does that mean that? Um, I guess my question is, what, what are the objectives of the changes to the standard? Is it to make it cheaper, make it, um, you know, open it up to more manufacturers? What's the, you know, what are they trying to accomplish? So currently there is no standard. Okay. There is for SLSA. So that's where the manufacturer builds, and the ELSA. There's standards for those, those aircraft, okay. as currently. And what they do, Ask your question again. I just want to so, sure. so the question is, what is the objective of developing these standards? I guess so. Mm -hmm. Is it is it defining an entirely new category? I guess is what you're saying, or is it taking an existing category and making it uh, cheaper, faster, lighter, you know, better? What, what kind of where? So it's a combination. Okay. So the new Mosaic aircraft that are going to fall under SLSA and ELSA, like sport. Uh, what this is going to do is allow a manufacturer to be able to build the aircraft according to the new limitations or, or new uh, um, standards. Standards, yeah, that, that the FAA is approving to be able to use. So, so does that mean that it, it does it still have to go through the certification process? This or? is the certification. This is the certification. Yeah, and that's where I was going to go next is. The reason this is so important and so good is it it is not a Part 23 aircraft, nor will it ever be. So this this is a new newer way the FAA is allowing industry and the, to use a consensus standard to certificate an aircraft. And what we see long term, and even the FAA says this, down the road as as these things start flying. Safety data shows that they're just as safe, if not safer, than a Part 23 aircraft. We're going to see uh, some of this is going to bleed over into the certified world of how the using consensus standard instead of uh, regulation. So there, there's a you know it's, it's very in depth, but but that's the short of it. it it's a good thing. So the, the hope then is that aircraft will be developed faster and they'll be less expensive. That's the whole point. The whole reason for all the, to do this and the shortage of training aircraft as the, the current certified aircraft are aging, you know, getting older and older. Uh, they wanted to, the FAA wanted to get more training aircraft into the mix and this is one part of the reason they're doing this as well. So, yes? So our is what's happening, let's just take a 172 as an example. Is Cessna going to build a Cessna 172 that's a light sport and a Cessna 172 that's whatever it was 
before? I, I'm, I'm a little confused about what. So that's going to be up to the manufacturer. But I mean, could they? Could sure, they, they could. Sure, they so could. There, so there's going to be perhaps, a, let's just say, a Cessna 172 that's a certified aircraft under the old system, mm -hmm. and then a 172 that could be this. Yeah, and I have a feeling what you would see is eventually they the probably stop building the certified and just do the 100 consensus standard because it's easier to control for the manufacturer. Yeah, possibly. Don't know for sure that's going to happen. But it, it, it's, it's a whole different way of thinking on the certification of aircraft. It really is. That. So in these standards, when they're being developed, there's numerous subcommittees down to, okay, we're going to, we need to do one on uh, uh, the airspeed, you know, 200 pilots that no matter what, you know, how great light sport aircraft are, and I'm a firm believer in them, they, they will only, I'm only flying certified, you know. Um, well, certification is still required for commercial operations, right? Yeah, other than the aerial work, I, I think Which there's a lot. We got to see on that what, what's that limitation going to be. So what comes out of there? Yes, sir. So I'm going to throw a loaded question out there. Uh huh. A and P, no medical, 101 72. Are we still going to have the IA component in here? And how would that also apply to home builds that are resold? in the market or any of the other unique maintenance requirements? Yeah. Do you see any changes? Yeah, so aircraft, certified aircraft that are gonna be qualified as light sport aircraft, at this time, they still have to be maintained as certified aircraft, A and P. With an so, IA annual? With an IA annual currently. Yeah, that is not in the this NPRM to address that. It's on our radar. <laughs> this is one of those in the future I see we'll be looking at. Um, and then the other part of that question? Well, the various levels, because we have things like home belts. Many yes. people buy used home belts. How would that... Um, yeah, so there is already an avenue for that. Uh, right now, somebody that has a, buys an experimental aircraft that's been built, a home built, uh, they are able to go to a repairman course yeah, I think it's 107 hours or something like that. It's a week. It's a week-long course. They're able to go to that and come back as the repairman for that aircraft. And then they can maintain it and they can do the condition inspection. And I was fishing if there were any changes related to it. Not, not in this current NPRN. Uh, they're, they're, we're looking at the repairman side of things. And they're trying to increase the training up to like almost a P level, it looks like. So we, we got to do a deep dive in there and, and see what's going on there. That's not going to get through, I'm pretty sure, because uh, there would be a lot of people raising up about that. And one other thing that may not apply to anyone in the room, but a lot of countries have reciprocity. Um, if Mosaic passes, how many countries would this trickle down to? So because it's going through ASTM, which is an international organization, um, we have other authorities in the room with us. All week, I was, uh, Brazil had two, two reps in the room. They're ahead of us on Lake Sport Aircraft. They, they've already issued theirs. It's not as expansive as ours, but they are definitely looking at, okay, we're doing this next on, on, to catch up with us. So yeah, we're, you know, it's just like, uh, we're looked on, by other countries as kind of a leader in, in aircraft. Even though in Europe, they got some phenomenal light sport aircraft, just phenomenal. And that's gonna allow those to be brought in this country too, under this expansion, which is great, because they're beautiful, beautiful aircraft. Um, so yeah, the other countries are paying very close attention. They are going to emulate what comes out of Mosaic as close as they can get through their line. Um, you know, to include Akeo. Akeo is involved in this as well. So, any other questions on Mosaic before I move on? Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> because it allows any number of engines, and because people are doing all kinds of crazy things with vertical takeoff and landing and um, designing all kinds of uh, EABs, um, 
for a designer to then design it and market it, um, how is that going to be looked on by this uh, infrastructure where you're going to have all these amazing new ideas come forward for all kinds of different mixture of aircraft that don't fit into these slots, mm -hmm. like a gyroplane or a helicopter or a conventional aircraft or any of those. Well, how, how is this body going to deal with all this new inventiveness? So you're, you're the, the committee you're talking about, the Lex Ford Committee? So one of the things we're doing is we are writing the consensus standard to a, as generic as we're able to for the aircraft to fit as many of the new technology aircraft coming in uh, to give that bandwidth. And the beauty is if we need a different or need to add a consensus standard or change because it's not a regulation, we can within, within weeks we can have a new consensus standard developed. Uh, I've seen them turn in in a few days, you know. So we get we get rid of a lot of the bureaucracy of regulation rulemaking that the FAA, by law, has to go through. I mean, a typical regulation is six years, start to finish. That's if it's not expedited. Very few ever get it expedited, and that's by law. It's a certain amount of comment time that they have to do. And, each office, the, the part pilots that refuse to fly a light sport aircraft. They're going to want to stay in certified aircraft. So the demand's still going to be there. It's going to be a business decision, I think, for the for the manufacturers at a certain point. Case in point, look at Cessna and the 162 Skycatcher. That was a light SLSA aircraft that they have stopped supporting. They walked away from it. And right now, people are flying them and they don't, they can't, they can't even upgrade the avionics in it. Um, and I'll just mention in that regard, one of the things this committee I'm on with Light Sport, we're, we're broaching that subject for getting third party authorization to do upgrades on, on even Skycatchers or any, any aircraft in the Light Sport area that is not, that, let's say the manufacturer folded up, but there's aircraft out there that need support. A third, third party authorizations are going to be. We're pushing a consensus standard right now to start allowing that. Um, so yeah, you know, it's going to be up to the manufacturers. There'll be some business decisions made, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but there's always going to be pilots that, no matter what, you know how great light sport aircraft are, and I'm a firm believer in them, they they will. Only, I'm only flying certified. You know. Um, well, certification is still required for commercial operations. Yeah, other than the aerial work, okay. I think it's there's a lot. We got to see on that what, what's that limitation going to be. So what comes out of there? Yes, sir. So I'm going to throw a loaded question out there. Uh -huh. A and P, no medical, 10172. Are we still going to have the IA component in here? And how would that also apply to home belts that are resold in the market or any of the other unique? maintenance requirements. Yeah. Do you see any changes? Yeah, so aircraft, certified aircraft that are going to be qualified as light sport aircraft, at this time, they still have to be maintained as certified aircraft, A and P. With an IA annual? With an IA annual currently. That, that is not in the this NPR to address that. It's on our radar, though. <laughs> this is one of those in the future I see we'll be looking at. Um, and then the other part of that question? Well, the various levels, because we have things like home belts. Many yes. people buy used home belts. How would that be? Um, yeah, so there is applicable? already an avenue for that. Uh, right now, somebody that has a, buys an experimental aircraft that's been built, a home built, uh, they are able to go to a repairman course. I think it's 107 hours or something like that. It's a week. It's a week-long course. They're able to go to that and come back as the repairman for that aircraft. And then they can maintain it, and they can do the condition inspection. And I was fishing if there were any changes related to not, that. Not in this current NPR. Okay. Uh, they're, 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 we're looking at the repairman side of things. They're trying to increase the training up to like almost A&P level, it looks like. So we've we got to do a deep dive in there and, and see what's going on there. That's not going to get through. Sure, 
because uh, there would be a lot of people raising up about that. And one other thing that may not apply to anyone in the room, but a lot of countries have reciprocity. Um, if Mosaic passes, how many countries would this trickle down to? So because it's going through ASTM, which is an international organization, uh, we have other authorities in the room with us. All week, I was, uh, Brazil had two, two reps in the room. They're ahead of us on late sport air. They've, they've already issued theirs. It's not as expansive as ours, but they are definitely looking at, okay, we're doing this next on, on, to catch up with us. So yeah, we're, you know, it's just like, uh, we're looked on by other countries as kind of the leader in, in aircraft. Even though in Europe, they got some phenomenal light sport aircraft, just phenomenal. And that's gonna allow those to be brought in this country too, under this expansion, which is great, because they're beautiful, beautiful aircraft. Um, so yeah, the other countries are paying very close attention. They are going to emulate what comes out of Mosaic as close as they can get through their body, um, you know, to include ICAO. ICAO's involved in this as well. So, any other questions on Mosaic before I move on? Yes, sir. Um. <coughs> Because it allows any number of engines, and because people are doing all kinds of crazy things with vertical takeoff and landing and um, designing all kinds of uh, EABs, um, for a designer to then design it and market it, um, how is that going to be looked on by this uh, infrastructure where you're going to have all these amazing new ideas come forward for all kinds of different mixture of aircraft that don't fit into these slots mm -hmm. like a gyroplane or a helicopter or a conventional aircraft or any of those. Well, how, how is this body going to deal with all this new inventiveness? So you're, you're uh the committee you're talking about, the Light Sport Committee. So one of the things we're doing is we are writing the consensus standard to a, as generic as we're able to for the aircraft to fit as many of the new technology aircraft coming in uh, to give that bandwidth. And the beauty is if we need a different or need to add a consensus standard or change because it's not a regulation, we can within within weeks we can have a new consensus standard developed. Uh, I've seen them turn in, in a few days, you know. So we get we get rid of a lot of the bureaucracy of regulation rulemaking that the FAA by law has to go through. I mean a typical regulation is six years start to finish. That's if it's not expedited. Very few ever get expedited. And that's by law. It's a certain amount of comment time that they have to do and, each office, the department goes through, and then it goes to almost to Congress, I think. But it's, it's really labor intensive, where this is controlled by the industry. That's the beauty of it. And we're able to <coughs> adapt it accordingly. You anticipate that there will be a lot of new designs manufactured in the show order? Yeah. Yeah, we have, uh, we probably have four or five manufacturers in the room this week. And they're a major player in this. Yes. So, yeah, so one of the things I'll, I'll bring up that is not in this is, and I, I got, I was upset when I started with AOPA and started flying again. We have two RB12s, okay? Great little fun airplanes to fly. They're SLSA. Full glass, autopilots, everything, just beautiful. And a, one of our employees has an RB12 that's ELSA. No, his is amateur built. His is amateur, but I know some others have ELSA version. And because they have that experimental, experimental certificate, they are, their, they are the manufacturer. Well, ASTM for SLSA currently says that you cannot fly that aircraft in IMC under IFR conditions. You can fly, 
and you can file IFR for training, but you cannot go to, go into IMC. And that irked me because anyone with an experimental certificate on the exact same aircraft can fly all day long in IMC, you know? And that just, it pissed me off when I found that out. And uh, so I, as soon as I started with ASTM three years ago, I brought it up. I said, I want, I want IMC for light sport aircraft for SLSA. And they said, well, we tried that like five years ago and it blew up because several people didn't want it. So it was, it was voted down. Now it got voted up and we are, and we're, we're coming out with a consensus standard on SLSAs being able to fly IMC. And it, it may take a year to get through it because we're doing all the engineering part of it. It's not going to be at the same part 23 or, or you know, 91205. It's got to meet certain the requirements of 91205. So we have to make sure that require those requirements are in uh, the consensus standard in the end. But it still gives us the latitude to bring in new technologies to make it safer. You know, require autopilot. Let's say that's one we're probably going to have in there is. If you're going to fly IMC and a light SLSA, you need it. You got to have an autopilot, and it just helps reduce that workload. A uh, short circuit. For say again. You can take a certified plane and make it experimental. Yeah. Okay. And, okay. and therefore, it's no longer the SLSA. It's an E. Right. <laughs> it, and people do it all the time. So there's some of, one of them out of Europe. Isn't that a shortcut right into IMC for you? Say again? Isn't that a shortcut into flying in the clouds? Yeah, yeah. We we could take our SLSAs. They won't do it because yeah. I asked them. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. And uh, to uh, do that, but uh, yeah. So that's that's a, it's some of the things we're doing there. Is he in the room? I don't know if they're in the room. Oh, oh yeah, Rob Hackman. Yeah, he's my counterpart over there. Yes, I can see this really changing how many people go into EAA. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's pretty big. It's going to be very, uh, we think it will we'll be able to get it through this this round, this time. Because uh, there are a lot of us. And now, before there were some manufacturers that were against it, Evo. Mm -hmm. And now, all the manufacturers in the room are saying, yeah, I want I want to sell airplanes that can go IMC. It makes no sense. So we can build my airplane and go IMC all day long. And the FAA said from day one, that you get con the consensus standard said it, we don't care. As long as you meet the aircraft requirements and the pilot requirements, still gonna have to have an, have an IFR rating to do it. So as long as you meet both of those FAAs, they're hands off, they're good to go. So this is where the consensus standard group says, yeah, we need to make some changes. And uh, I'm so glad I brought that up because, boy, I, I, the first guy I talked to was with Vans Aircraft, and he lit right up. He's like, "Yeah, we're we need to file it. We need to get this moving again." <laughs> so it was great. Any other questions before I move on to the fuel? Okay. So the pursuit of the unleaded high octane fuel. How many has heard about the the, the fuel issue? <laughs> Probably ever. So the final endangerment finding has been issued by EPA, which says lead is bad, possibly causes problems. Yeah, we know that. We fully expected it. So the associations, us and everyone else, has said from day one, we are not defending lead. We know it's bad. We got. We know we got to get rid of it. But it's got to be done in a safe and smart way, because 70% of the GA aircraft can fly. UL-94, lower octane fuel. However, the 30% that remains burns over 70% of bad gas that requires high octane, 100 low lead. So, and, and when you look at volume of low lead, how much is being pumped in one year, that's four hours of automotive fuel. It's the, that's the equivalent volume. So. We've, we've never defended lead, but we do want to put it in perspective. Uh, so what that did, the endangerment finding started the rulemaking process for EPA to develop a rule 
that says to the FAA, you've got to set the standards for ag gas to get rid of lead. The FAA has the obligation to develop those and the standards, here they're using the term standards, that's rules, regulations, uh, for the composition and chemical and physical properties for aircraft fuel. So the FAA does that. Now they, they use a lot of industry to get, get there. Uh, by law under the Clean Air Act, some of it falls under the Clean Air Act, EPA and FAA must consult with each other and these rulemaking requirements so they are developed in a matter, and this is important, does not adversely affect aviation safety. So even EPA and the Clean Air Act, you know, at the uh, executive level, it, it's, they, they know, uh, we still, we definitely know we have, uh, oh, this is by 2030 or sooner. Uh, we believe it's going to get here before 2030, the unleaded fuel, with, and I'll talk more on the fuels here in a second. So what the endangerment finding does not do, this is important because, uh, you know, we, we hear, we get a lot of industry uh, airports trying to close. It's a new thing in the air. The new conversation is unleaded fuel. It's, it's killing us. we got to close the airport. We've actually had airports, three airports out in uh, California that, sh that removed Hunter Lipper. They just flat out pulled it. Uh, and that is extremely dangerous because you have transient aircraft coming in that require high octane and they can't fuel up. So they try to make that next airport when they thought they were going to be able to fuel up uh, there. And they've actually, they've lost one aircraft already because of that, pretty, pretty sure. Probably some decisions being made that shouldn't have to be made in that area. But what it does not do, it does not mean that Hunter Low Lead Fuel is banned from use immediately. And to the contrary, Hunter Low Lead is needed through the safe transition period to full availability of the unleaded fuel. That's key because if you look at UL94 unleaded fuel that Swift has out, has had it out for years, they're only at about 60 some airports in the country. So, you know, you can't fly across the country and not, you're not gonna have it everywhere you go. And there's no 100 low lead out, or I'm sorry, no unleaded 100 out yet that is commercially available. It also does not mean that airports should stop offering 100 low lead as it would adversely impact safety begin fracturing the U.S. airport fuel supply, infrastructure, and damage commerce. We saw those commerce numbers that GA does. I mean, think of the, imagine if you have a bunch of airports that are pulling on or low uh, prematurely until there's a 100-grade uh, fuel out there available. It does not cause the aircraft to be grounded or become prohibited from using 100 low I, I will add, these were addressed in the EPA finding, talking about the need for safety for the uh, requirement to keep fuel, hunter low lead, available until one can be, uh, unleaded can be commercially available. These are the four contenders that are out there right now. I say contenders, GAMI on the bottom left has already got an approved STC fuel 100 grade out there. It's G100 UL. Uh, they've got it developed. Uh, they're doing some demonstration type testing. Uh, people are, there's some people find it is not commercially available. He, because it's an STC process, so the bottom two, SWIFT and GAN, are both STCs, supplemental type certificates. That process is proprietary between the manufacturer, the producer, the fuel producer, and the FAA, the FAA office. So, the public is not able, not even us, nobody else can see, even other departments of the FAA can't see what that fuel is made of. They can see in, they can see in general what it is, but not a deep analysis. And so there, it, it, there's some strife out there, you know, about, oh, we don't know what's in it, we can't run it, you know, but there's people running the fuel and doing some demonstration uh, of that G100 UL. It's gonna get there, but there, it's an uphill climb to start getting it out there uh, produced. 
SWIFT is the uh, another STC. They've got 100R, they're calling it. They are doing it uh, with a long cone. Wrong word. <laughs> simultaneously, that's the word I was looking for. They're doing it simultaneously getting an ASTM consensus standard because the fuel is done by ASTM consensus standard in the past. So they're the only consensus standard out there for fuel. GAMI is, they did their own standard, which is legit. I mean, it's an approved process. His fuel is approved under their own standard. And so when SWIFT's 100R comes out, uh, as long as he gets through the process and starts getting it out, it will have an ASTM standard. And what that does is allow industry, a lot of the players, OEMs, to see, okay, it's got a consensus standard. We know it meets this level because it's a, <coughs> those consensus standards are pretty public. You have to join to get them. But, um, you know, the information's there. Where GAMI's is a lot more close hold because it's so per, per, proprietary. The top two fuels are in the PAFI program. So that's the Piston AVA, Piston Engine Aviation Fuels Initiative. That thing's been going on since 2000, early 2000s, that program. They, and, and you know, you see a lot in media about uh, the PAFI program didn't work and all this. What people miss is there was probably over 100 fuels that were brought into the program originally recipes and they all failed so that program that PAFI program allowed to identify a lot of the parameters okay we know this don't work we know this don't work you know and they they, they live test this fuel they run engines in the test cells and all that they've cratered so many engines trying to get find this fuel it's been unbelievable um, so so you know PAFI has worked, it just hadn't, they had, the producers haven't came out with a fuel uh, that made it all the way through yet. Now the two fuels listed, Afton Chemical and Philip 66 and Lyondale Basil and VP Racing, their fuels are in, the, they're not doing STC, they're doing the PAFI process. So the FAA test center out in New Jersey is the one that's running these fuels on the FAA's engines. I think they've contracted Lycoming to assist as well to help out on some of that testing. Uh, I think uh, one of them, I'm not sure which, one of them made 75 hours so far in a 150 hour, they call it a mini durability test, which they hard, they run this fuel and, and these engines hard and all, all the other ones were failing at like 25, 30 hours, they blow the engine. Because uh, what they're doing, they're taking the lead out Lead is what increases the octane. Octane, higher octane, prevents detonation. You know, it, it helps lubricate the engine in, in, in a lot of ways. And when you take that lead out, you've got to replace it with something that'll bring the octane to that level. And uh, so a lot of, lot of chemists are involved in this at this level. Uh, the other few, I'm not sure exactly where they're at right now. They, they're both in the mini dur durability phase. I'm not sure how far along they are. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to speak to that a little bit. Any questions on the fuels? Yes. Is, is it going to require any modification to the fuel delivery system, like bladders or, or hoses or anything along those lines? Great question. So according to GAMI, their fuel, theirs does not. Theirs is fully fungible, which means it can be intermixed with 100 low lead all day long and it doesn't affect it. Uh, the other fuels, not sure yet. So part of the testing in the PAFI fuels is going to be, at, if they get through the many durability, then they go into full testing, which is probably a year long. And that's where, I mean, they, they go hard on them. Material testing, seals, everything. They've done a little bit of that before the mini durability, enough to say, okay, we think it's going to go. Let's do the mini durability. If it passes that, then we're going to deep dive. What they did before, and they learned from this, 
they were running the, the heavy test from the beginning, and they were cratering loaders. We're like, okay, we got we got to change the process here. So that was part of that. Did I answer your question? Yep. Okay. Yes. There must be tens of thousands of light sport aircraft that use uh, a two cycle and four cycle aircraft that use MOGAS right. uh, when they're flying locally, but when they want to go cross country, they can't carry their own fuel, so they have to use the AVGAS. Mm -hmm. Are you looking at the impact of this fuel on two cycle engines? And one of the problems with two cycle, of course, is ethanol mm -hmm. for the tanks and other things. So is the industry looking at the impact on these existing engines that are in the many, many thousands? Yeah, so, so the testing on this, I know GAMI tested uh, pretty hard on a lot of different engines. I'm not sure how many. The PAFI engines uh, testing, they, what they do, they start with a four corner test. So they're gonna, the toughest engine out there is probably an IO 550D that's in Cirrus, a lot of Cirrus is out there. And they, so they put it at the highest power and they, they use that as one of their, their high corner tests. And they'll do, they probably test about eight different engines that kind of envelop the full picture of all the engines. And that's how they come up with that. Uh, and Gammy did similar uh, things, I know. And I think Swift's doing the same thing in their testing. So yeah, to answer the, your question, they, they definitely look at all the different engines that are out there and how that'll impact. It's all part of it. Yes? Yeah. Uh, since you have uh, currently two uh, fuels that uh, have STCs, the, the, the challenge, I was looking at Gammy, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of Gammy because Lord knows I've been down there enough times and gave, gave them some money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they do know their stuff. They're, they're oh, a pretty savvy group. I'll tell you what, they are, they're chemists. <laughs> they're fuel chemists. Yeah. I mean, they're they got, engineers. Yeah, I've seen their test stands and yeah. stuff like that. You know, like, okay, yeah, yeah you know the market here. Uh, Absolutely. You know. But to get the fuel out there, Airports, you know, I was like, okay, do I buy my STC for my aircraft or just yeah. kind of sit on it because where can I use it? Yeah, exactly. Uh, is there some way that uh, what needs to happen to get airports to switch from uh, 100 low lead over to uh, the unleaded? Yeah, great question. It's definitely a, a relevant question. So, you know, the big and some people say this is harder than actually developing the fuel is to getting it out there, getting it commercialized across the country. That is a huge uphill climb in Gammy's case, especially because it's so proprietary. People, you know, there's a lack of some trust out there by some of the OEMs saying, well, we don't know what's in it. We're not going to, you know, do warranty and all this. So he's got, and I say he as George Broadley is, you know, the main, main guy out there with, uh, with his boss too, you know, uh, Tim, I think it is. But, uh, you know, they've got some work to do to help get public interest up more uh, to start getting the demand push uh, from the OEMs and all that. And he's, they've got to work at their, you know, relationship building, I would say, with uh, the OEMs as well. To start, and I know he's been. They've been trying. They've been trying to do that, you know, with some, through through NDAs and stuff, non-disclosures, that kind of thing. Because when you think about it, you know, he's got a recipe that's working the way it looks. And right now, you know, if somebody steals a recipe, it's, you know, that would be the end. You know, and you can't. He's got to protect that. So I understand both sides of it for that very reason. But it's, it's not an easy task to get out there. He's got to get a, a, a fuel producer to, to produce it. And in his case, I, I think it's just mixing, <laughs> you know, uh, to get start getting it out there. And I think what you'll see is you'll probably see some airports that he'll end up making an agreement with to start getting it out there at a certain point when some of this demonstration that's going on is starts getting out there and get more public uh, the results of that, I think it, that's when you'll start seeing some airports start trying to pick it up and bring it in. So, 
it's, it, it'll, be, it'll be several years probably for him to get it out there. It's like, who first? Who's going to go first? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yes, sir. Do you know what the cost of that STC is? It like a couple dollars per horsepower or something uh, that Gammy's selling? You know, I don't know. I, I know, like um, that's not like right. A friend of mine got six hundred for my three hundred horsepower. What's that? Six hundred. Six hundred. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. it seems to me like um, you know, I had a friend who bought uh, auto fuel STC for a 0360 172, but in that case, it's going to pay for itself pretty rapidly because it's burning auto fuel. But this, yeah. you're just paying six hundred bucks for an STC. So you Probably buy the same price for fuel. Like I don't, I don't know what the, the sell is until the fuel's gone. The, the, the benefit of the uh, maintenance tail, uh, if, if you ever had, usually it's oil change. You pull just your rugs and sort of scrub. You, you get more lead. You make pencils out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and if you ever been in an aircraft where you you got a rough engine happen on you, and you have to make a uh, um, center, I've got to divert, um, yeah. the engine's kind of running up. Well, that, that kind of screws up the whole time. It's table. just lead. And, and it, uh, yeah, it just lead build up. And uh, you know, the maintenance issues with your, uh, your valves and things like that. So you run it cleaner. Much you know, cleaner. That'll save you on the main, uh, yeah. the wrench turn. Over a long time. Yeah, yeah you can. You can look at Borescope cylinders that have been running unleaded, and they're they're just beautiful. I mean, totally clean. It's pretty pretty unreal. It, it's going to have some huge benefit, you know, definitely. All right. Any other questions on fuels? Okay. Uh, if you wanted to do some more uh, looking at information, I just list three uh, sites there. Uh, so we have one at AOPA. Eagle is the Eliminated Aviation Gas and Clean Lead Emissions. That's the uh, uh, conglomerate of associations, uh, OEMs, the fuel providers. You know, there are a lot of people in that. And then uh, the FAA has a site as well. Like get a lot of the info on the PAFI program and stuff there. Other helpful AOPA resources. Uh, we're always here to help. You know, we, we do have a pilot information center that gets calls all day long, uh, member services, basic med guidance. Um, that How many are on basic med this year? Yeah, love it. Best thing I ever did is switch. <laughs> it's a great program. Uh, pilot protection services, uh, I'm a member of that. And I don't get that free, I pay extra for that, just like a member, regular member would have to. Um, it's a very uh, great program, and even for buying aircraft, there you have attorneys on call that they will assist in purchase and everything, uh, looking at reviewing contracts, all that. And then EFERC is for flight training programs. So, how many are AOPA members? All right. Uh, if you're not, you may want to consider joining for your chance to win that. So that just came out of the, a year restoration, and they fly it throughout the year. It was at Oshkosh. It wasn't that color, though. Uh, that, they, that thing is a beast. 195 horsepower, IO370 Continental Prime engine, uh, glass and round dial mix of instruments, uh, lightweight interior, big tires, and it's going to be given away January of 24. We give away aircraft away every year. Uh, last year we gave a Tiger away. Uh, that gentleman, uh, I, I saw it on YouTube the other day actually. <laughs> he was out flying, uh, doing some flights, and uh, loaned it to somebody to use. It's like, well, I'll, I'll fly it. <laughs> but, uh, and then the year before that was on that beginning slide, that red RV-10. That was two years ago we gave that away. Two or three. I'd have to look. Does this do a clean stall at 54? <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure it'll qualify. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's got the leading edge cuffs on it and everything. It, this thing is a backcountry beast. It really is. 
So 2024, how many heard of the Arsenal of Democracy flyover over downtown DC years, several years ago? So picture that. So as I said, AOPA's 85th anniversary is next year. We are going to be doing a general aviation flyover, same route that the Arsenal of Democracy did. There's gonna be 20 chapters of aviation history, GA history, two to four aircraft in each chapter. And um, the lead aircraft is the 1944 Beechcraft Staggerwing. That one right there. And it's owned by Mark Baker, our president. He's the lead aircraft for that. Going to be happening. Uh, be on the lookout for that. That is going to be huge. There's no cost just to get, get into DC. But they fly right over the mall at like 1,500 feet. Uh, it is just phenomenal. So highly recommend that. And we're also, my understanding is we're going to have venues on the mall too. AOPA is and probably invite a lot of others to join. But it's going to be quite an event. Uh, so that'll be coming up in uh, early 24 also. Any questions? A little bit over. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity. Thank you very much. You bet. I will uh, put my information up there if you want to snap a picture. If you need anything from AOPA, regulatory, uh, if you have issues going on with a FISDO, that's my specialty. Anything to do with a FAA that need, you need assistance with. Um, our office building sits about two blocks down from the FAA and not too far from Congress. Uh, so we stay pretty busy. Do the announcements? Or? Uh, well, I can't. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just want to ask. Yeah.